It has been said that average people want you to stay average. Welcome to the Breaking Average Podcast. The podcast designed to challenge you to break the mold that average has on the world. Each episode offers insights directly from those who choose to break average every day. Now, for the latest insights, here are your hosts, Paul Gustafson and Reef Morris. Hey, this is Paul Gustafson. Welcome to another episode of the Breaking Average Podcast, and I've got Rick Morris. Rick, how you doing, buddy? Doing fantastic. How about you, Paul? I'm doing good. I cannot. I've been looking forward to this this discussion today for the next, gosh, I don't know how many weeks we got, but we have, what a lineup of books we've got, huh? That's right. That's right. We've got a lot of learning that's coming this way. Yep. Guys, we wanted to give you the best of favorites. There's so many books out there. In fact, Rick, as I was going through this, we, you and I selected 16 fantastic books and we're going to go through one book per podcast for the next 16 episodes. And I realized This could be such a breakthrough podcast season for us that uh, my guess, I'm just, uh, if I had a crystal ball, I would imagine that most of our viewers and listeners are going to want to have another set of 16 at some point, because the way that you and I are going to break this thing down, the nuggets that we're going to share and the impact of these books, um, they're significant for us. We put books that really have impacted us personally and professionally, and um, I just can't wait. I want to be able to share and add value to others. And, and we're giving credit, a hundred percent credit to the authors and the publishers and those behind these books. So we're not, we're not trying to take content and reuse it just for ourselves. We're, we're highlighting this in a really practical way so that you can start to apply and use and, uh, and make a difference in your life. So Rick thoughts on that. Yeah. What's interesting. And in, you know, if we, if we use our, our friend and mentor, John uh, Maxwell as, as an example, especially when he was doing developing the leader within you, if you remember, he was contracted to rewrite like 15% of that book and, in, in yeah. you know, publish a second version. And when he got into it, he rewrote like 85% of it. Yeah. And when he was telling the story, he was saying, well, when I wrote the book, it was the best that I had at that time. That, yes. that was the best I had. And now I've grown and that's no longer the best. What's, what's been impactful for me already is some of the books that, that we suggested, they, they've been near and dear in our heart, but it's been years yep. since I've been through some of these. And yep. I've definitely changed since I read it the first time. So going back through some of these books has been really, really cool uh, because I'm picking up different things or realizing what the impact really was. And, and I've realized that I, I'm always into the new books. Like there's always new books. I've got a, a stack over here ready to, to, to read and process, right? Yeah. Um, and ready to go. But sometimes it, it really makes sense to go revisit these classics and go through them now just to see, have we grown? Have we learned? And what are we going to pick up this time? Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel the same way, right? So when we pick up these books and, and um, go back and look at our old highlights and, and then I see other things in it uh, and I can't wait. I want to hear your process of how you digest a book. You know, do you do multiple scans here in this case, right? So what you're talking about is books that we've already read and digested and, and really absorbed. And now we're doing a go back. These are go back books for both Rick and I. Um, some books that Rick picked it that I had never read. And there's a couple of that I picked that he's never read. So that'll be kind of first time experiences for us, but we're going to have fun with it. Um, But let's, let's talk about this for all our listeners and viewers. What's your secret tip to really digesting a book? So So, with you. Yeah, for me, in fact, I've got a funny story about us, Paul. I, I, I remember this to this day. It was one of our first real big interactions. I think like we were aware of each other, but we really hadn't spent a ton of time to each other. But uh, Paul Sheely did uh, photo reading and taught right. us photo reading at, at John Maxwell team and took us through like this thing. And, and I've done that ever since. So to answer your question directly, I, I will photo read the book first um, and go through that. Um, and again, you can look up Paul Sheely that, that that's way too much to discuss on a, on a podcast, but I photo read the book. Um, and then I, and I generally do that with the, the physical book. Uh, and then I'll grab the Kindle version and in the Kindle version, I look at the popular highlights and go through that and see what kind of speaks to me. Yeah. And then 
it, as part of the photo reading process, you sit and kind of think about the book and there's certain words that are going to just jump off the page yep. at me. And that's the subconscious just saying, you need to read this. Um, and so that's, that's what I kind of do. And then I'll do, uh, the, it's called a super dip and read from there. So when I'm going back through the book a third time, certain words or phrases jump out and I'll mm -hmm. pause there and read that section. And then I just kind of cruise on through the book and, and that's how I do it. Coming back to the funny story with you though, you know, Paul Sheely walked us through this first time experience and I did have a pretty significant experience the first time that I, that I went through it. I, an answer in a book was served to me like right on time. And I remember coming up to you and, and talking to you. And I was like, what do you think about it? And you were like, yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't, I, I don't think. And I, and, and then I explained my experience to you. And what I've always loved about you is you, you do have kind of a quick opinion sometimes, but you're always very, very thoughtful in, in, in choice of words. And I explained my experience to you and you were like, you know, as you mentioned it, I, I saw Paul Martinelli do that. And he goes, you know, I don't know, maybe it does work. <laughs> it's just so funny. <laughs> that was like all in a five minute conversation. But for yeah. some, I, I'll never forget that. Well, that's true, right? I, yeah. I've seen, I've seen a couple people actually do that practice because it seems so odd. You know, it's not, it's not what how, how they taught us in school, Rick. Yeah, that's not yeah. how we're taught to read. But um I will say this, uh, the, the one thing it gives you permission, the Shealy approach that you shared at least gave me a permission to say, you know what, it's okay to thumb through the book and, um, and just allow, allow that experience of kind of walking through it. Those, those images, you know, every page is an image. It's not just words, but there, it's an image. And there's something that kind of captures your attention, right? If we looked at a picture, you and I, right beautiful pictures of the mountains or the ocean or you know great cities that they're pretty powerful we see it we recognize it um we can see the value in it and uh, it speaks to us well the same way one of the things that i learned from you and, and others is that we can actually can do that with pages of a book so um that's what you shared with me and you were able to take my book you know my my book that i did a few years ago leaders press on and you did that yeah <laughs> and, and then you interviewed me and you nailed it you're like yeah, yeah he, he actually did and, and you said paul i like this photo read it i didn't i re didn't read it cover to cover i did like, it live a few times paul so we remember I, you know for yeah. for five years i had the live radio show so there was a couple of times there was one time i was doing it in front of a live audience there was about 300 people there yeah. And they switched who I was interviewing at the last minute. And the guy had written a book and I was like, well, give that to me really quickly. And I, I went off into a corner for about three minutes, photo read it, came back and interviewed him. And, and I was asking him questions. He was like, where was that in the book? And I was like, That's, it was right here. Yeah, right here. But what does this mean? And he was like, I don't even know. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I want that skill. That's a superpower skill, guys. But I, I have kind of garnered a... Uh, an alternate superpower skill that I, I love, right? So we, we were talking before we hit the record, there's three different formats, guys, of books. There's the print book. And we're gonna be talking about this book here in just a minute, right? Yeah, First, buddy. break all the rules. So there's the, there's the print, right? Then there's the Kindle. Or if you're a uh, Barnes and Noble guy, what is that called? Nook. Nook, yep. All right. Um, and then there's the Audible, all right? So here's my, my scoop. I, I'll look at the Kindle first because I can digest a book pretty darn quick. And uh, I've got a little system and I'll, I'll share that with, with the readers here or with all the listeners here in terms of how you can really read. Um, and then if, it's a, if it compels me early on, I'm like, man, I need to listen to this. Because, you know, a lot of times I'm in the car. I can't read <laughs> all the time. So I listen. And listening is just as powerful for me as reading. And then if it's, if it's a really good book and I need that reference, cause I'm going to communicate it and share it, you know, I need to reference it for myself. I'll get the print. So that's usually, uh, you'll see that I probably have any book that's worth having. I have it in all three formats and, uh, and I'm thankful for that. I'll go back and re-listen to stuff while I'm cutting the grass too. And it's good. So that's, that's sort of my, my initial take. Now when it's, Amazon's great guys. Cause you can do a book preview. You can kind of look at it before you get it. It's not quite though. I, I, here's the question I have for you, Rick. When you go to Barnes and Noble, I almost said borders, but I think there's only one left and I know where it is it's in column Lapore. But if you go to Barnes and Noble and you see some books that you're like, okay, I need to look at these things. 
are you doing a quick photo read of that or what, what, how do you yeah. scan that book before you like, hmm, yeah, I'm a, I need to grab this. Well, I've got a couple other things too. Uh, I pay for a service called Blinkist um, and Blinkist takes, you know, a lot of popular books and boils it down to, you know, two or three page summary. It's not the book. It's more of a summary of the ideas. And so yep. I use Blinkist um, and I try to read something on Blinkist every day. Um, and that will trigger me to, to go, you know, get that book. So I, if I really like what the Blinkist says, or there's even one or two good quotes in there that seems to prompt me, I'll go get that book. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at Barnes and Noble, I do a lot of uh, quick photo reading and uh, a lot of quick reads. Uh, and then there's times like th there was a book uh, that, that's not on our list, but it changed my career. Um, and I had no idea the impact it had on me until I, I reread it again just a, a few months ago. Uh, but there was a book I, I grabbed in a Barnes and Noble and I read it cover to cover in Barnes and Noble. Like it spoke to me that much. Uh, it was called Radical Project Management by Rob Thompson. It was the first project management book that ever made me laugh. And it gave me my path to, to write mine. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I go through all different types of uh, depending on what the material is in and of itself. But yeah, I, I, I can photo read in, in Barnes and Noble. Yep. There's there you go. Yeah, I love it. I love going into Barnes and Noble. I love picking up the book and just doing that quick scan. Guys, here's what I do for my quick scans. And Rick, certainly share more of what you do. But when I look, pick it up, right? Um, yeah, I, I'll look at the back. I'll look to see who's saying what about it. I'll certainly look at the advanced praise. But I don't put a lot of stock on all those advanced praises. That's great. There's some kind of relationship with the publicist and you know these other authors out there who've also written some fantastic books. And that's good. That gives the credit and credibility to the book itself. And it makes me some, it makes it something where I know I can trust it. However, I look at the table of contents, very critical. So what I do is like, okay, what does this thing have? Was there time taken to really structure the material that's going to be presented in this book so that it's going to allow me to digest it, use it for my own personal, you know, whether it's personally or professionally, and also for me to be able to share it potentially with other people, mastermind it. And we're doing these quick masterminds, guys. We're going to mastermind one book per episode for the next, you know, essentially 16 starting today. Um, so we're going to give you a little bit of the framework of these books based on those outlines. But here's something else that I do, guys. Dan Pink, thank you. He, uh, he shared something in his book, Win, about the last line. And that transformed, actually, it, it really accelerated my understanding and comprehension of a book. Don't do this for fiction. But for nonfiction, what you do is after you take a look at the table of contents, and by the way, the Ford's there for a reason. So you may want to read the Ford to see what, what the intent is of the book. But go to the last line in the book right before the acknowledgements or the index or whatever the appendices, appendices that might be there, that last chapter. So look for the last chapter, look for the last paragraph, look for the last sentence. So I, what I do is I look at that last chapter, kind of get a context from it. Sometimes I have to brush through that really fast. Then I look at that last paragraph and then I see, is there any context that I need to understand prior to that last paragraph? So I may scan back just a little bit. But I always look at that last line because why? It tells me where it's going, right? Every book is a map. It's a map book. And I need to know the map book is actually has a destination in mind for you, the reader. It's trying to take you somewhere, right? Where you are, we're all different. Or every, every reader, when they pick up a book, they're in a different state. But the author's job is to take you, no matter where you are, to a, a common location a common destination so i look for that last line so those those are kind of my quick tips when i evaluate a book how about you yeah so the first i mean i do the photo read through the first time which is literally just about two seconds a a, a, a page you've, you're flipping through it um the second thing i do is is look for bolds italics um and then the first paragraph last paragraph of each chapter just yeah. kind of breeze through it that way um and then i think on the book and what you'll learn is your subconscious will, will serve the information that you need, right? Your subconscious process is so much more than your conscious brain does. Yep. And so as I flip through it a third time, I'm, uh, if a word or a phrase jumps out at me, that's my subconscious saying, you need to read this piece. Yep. And so then I'll, I'll deep, and that's called a super read and dip. Um, so basically scanning the pages, words jump out, I read those words. And then I pretty much have the context of the book that I want. If I really want to, um, if I really want to commit it, 
right to 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 memory like it's just so moving and it's something i want to be able to quote and that kind of thing i'll then mind map it so yeah. i basically write the words that were important to me and you know why were they important what was the outcomes and that visual side of it which i'm not very creative i'm not very good at drawing those but just that activity of of connecting the dots is what sinks it into my brain i like that i like that well guys i'm ready uh, you know, Rick, I know you're ready. So I think yeah. all our listeners and viewers are ready for us to dive into this first book. And we're going to share a little bit more of our tips and tricks in terms of what we do to, to break down and, and capture nuggets that we want to share. Um, but uh, let's dive in. You picked this book. We had some fun. Um, so uh, we, uh, we rolled a uh, we, middle of the week. I said, Rick, let's get in there, man. Let's pick the 16. And we did a little quick draft and, you know, um, We'll, we'll highlight that in a future episode so you can kind of see how this all came about, sort of like behind the scenes. How did Rick and Paul pick these 16? But we'll start right away. This is the book that we're going to start off with. Um, first, break all the rules. You picked this book. I did. And why, um, did, you, why did you pick this book? Yeah, it, it, so first, it, it was kind of the first management book that changed my style of management. Um, and, and so... You know, it came out in in 2000. You know, some roughly around there. Uh, I bought it, I think, in 2000. Uh, I was just coming off of a, a large uh, uh, shift at GE, um, and so GE's focus was, you know, the, the famous uh, 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 Jack Welch uh, piece was, you know, the bottom 10 percent. Mm -hmm. All focused on the bottom 10 percent, and we did so much work on the bottom 10 percent. And one of the first things here in first break all the rules that that spoke to me. Um, was to not focus uh, all of your attention on your poor performers. And, and so one thing I liked about the book is, first of all, it was based on research, right? So I, yep. love, I love books that are based on research. They go, they identify these monikers so you understand what they're saying is a great leader, right? And um, so, for instance, a, as they go through it too, they're talking about um, what makes a great workplace. Um, and I think these 12 things, I'm just going to run through this really quickly. Um, do I know what is expected of me at work? Do I have the equipment and material and I need to do my work right? At work, do I have the best opportunity to do what I do best every day? In the last seven days, have I, got, have I gotten recognition or praise? Does my supervisor or someone at work seem to care about me as a person? Is there someone at work who encourages my development? At work, do my opinions seem to count? Does the mission purpose of my company make me feel that my work is important? Are my coworkers committed to doing quality work? Do I have a best friend at work? In the last six months, have I talked to someone about my progress? And this last year, have I had opportunities to, at work to learn and grow? And what he says here is, as a manager, as a leader, you need to make sure your employees can respond with a resounding yes, right? And so, first of all, that's the, the frame and context. I was like, wow, that's a little bit different because before it was all about performance, metrics, and things like this. This had a lot of feeling and caring and empathy involved, which I, I, I wasn't used to in the management role, again, coming from, yeah. from GE. Um, so it was really, really interesting to me. It spoke to me. Um, but then when he, when he got into the fact that uh, you really need to focus on your, your top performers because... If you're always focused on poor performers, then the top performers feel neglected. And coming back to those 12 questions, they start to feel like you don't care about them and you're not involved in them and you're not talking about their progress. And what, what I see so many companies do is their best employees, they fail to praise them because they feel like they're praising them all the time. Yes. Right. And so yeah. then you start to, it, it becomes commonplace. But the, the problem is, is when you stop doing that, they all of a sudden start going, uh-oh, have I, right? And then they start to spiral. So this whole thing of spend the most time with your best people, I thought was a pretty revolutionary idea at the time, right? He says, basically, great managers by science, great managers, they do play favorites. Yes. <laughs> they do. They do. Right? They right? Do. And, and you should. Great managers spend I, the most time with the most productive members of their staff. They should. Yeah. And uh, I, I just but found that interesting. It is interesting because how often do we, we're like, no, no, you can't say that, Rick. You have to give everybody 100%. Well, no, there's no way possible. Let's be honest. Let's be real, right? I love these questions. And I know you, you kind of work, work through it. Guys, as you're listening or watching this, these questions, I, I was blown away by these questions. 
the they call it the core elements needed to attract focus and keep the most talented employees right it's really talk about here we we have the we call this podcast the breaking average podcast the whole idea is we want you to break average we don't want you to settle for the status quo we don't want we don't want to settle for just the traditional approach to to how to execute business and now in in light of covid and everything else that's happening we need to step up in a bigger way than we ever have yeah and while this book may have been written 10 12 or 10 11 years ago 12 years ago it is more relevant now than it has ever been relevant by the way there has been an updated version of it the one that rick and i are thumbing through is the marcus buckingham titled one the new one um it's pretty much still intact they've i'm not sure i kind of i we need to interview marcus what's yeah. going on marcus how come your name's not on this book anymore but uh they do uh they do pay uh, credit to him and the Ford and uh, acknowledge it. But what they're saying is because it's really a Gallup research project and Marcus was leading that project way back when and they just did an update. They continued to pull on the research and these questions are still there. They're still valid. So let's kind of go through those questions again. I know you went through it, but I love this idea of, you know, the order of it. He talks, they talk about um, kind of a mountain uh, kind of, if you're going to summit the mountain, like how would you do it? Well, the intent of these 12 questions is really to help. You know, there's really an order to it. And so let me get to uh, my questions here. Um, mountain climbing. He says, they asked the question, why is there an order to the 12 items? And uh, they talk about picture in your mind's eye, a mountain. And I love this, just that illustration alone kind of paints the picture. I don't know if you've ever climbed a mountain, Rick. I'm sure you have, right? Yeah. So when you climb that mountain, you, you, you can't just climb it in one step. You got to make multiple steps. And so that base camp, um, th these are the questions of the 12, the two fundamental items that measure base camp is questions one and two. All right. I know what is expected of me at work and I have the materials and equipment I need to do my work right. All right. So your thoughts on that base camp, why are these two questions so critical for, for our base camp? Well, I mean, first of all, it's, it's setting direction, setting intention, yeah. right? I mean, that, that's the biggest thing. Um, I think the other thing is when we're setting intention and this was, this what, is what was really interesting for me reading through this again, as, as what's changed. Um, and in fact, I, I was so excited when I came across this, um, that, that I emailed this to you over the weekend, Paul, but you know, we have, we have this podcast called breaking average and there's a, a blurb in the book that literally says average is irrelevant. Yeah. And I was like, Whoa, what, you know, that, that really, I was like, well, what are we talking about here? But he says, consider what happens when performance is measured against excellent performers rather than average for data entry work. The national average is 380,000 key punches per month but a wise manager doesn't measure performance against that. Here's what happened when one manager used a top performer who quote averaged 560,000 punches per month as the standard within six months of receiving feedback and recognition, she was over the 3 million mark. Her manager designed a performance pay plan around her. And today the department quote average is over 1 million strokes. So coming back to, first of all, don't use average to measure yourself. Use better than average, use excellent. And then coming yep. back to base camp, when I'm setting that intention, that intention better be based on uh, phenomenal stuff. It, it reminds me of a story uh, that, that I stole from my father in his company. And what they did every year is they sat down and they said, okay, here is, here's our goal, right? Here's our goal. Um, and it was always you know, an advancement goal for the business. And then they said, here's a stretch goal. And they say, if we hit our stretch goal, we're taking everybody in the company and a plus one on a three-day cruise. Now, we lived in Orlando. It was pretty simple to, to, to do that, but they would go on a three-day cruise. Paul, they went on that cruise every year, mm. every single year. They set a goal, and then they would really push and do a stretch goal. When I started our Square Consulting, and it was just me, you know, two other guys who <laughs> first got started, but I did the same thing. I said, you know what? Here's our goal. But if we do this in sales, then we're all going to go to New York City. 
and we're yeah. going to spend a week in New York City. We we went to the beach and, and got condos on the beach for everybody's families and, and hung out as a huge you know group. We like we did all these little mini vacations, but we always hit the stretch goal that we pushed for. The yeah. only time we never hit a stretch goal is when I didn't set one. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you know, stretch goals are so important. It reminds me of the Roger Bannister. And we may have shared this in a podcast earlier, and that's certainly we highlighted in the book Breaking Average. But before Roger Bannister, nobody had broken the four-minute mile. Yep. Nobody had. What was the average, right? Everybody was trying to like, okay, I'm going to try to get as close to four. But then he's mapped it out. And he's like, well, wait a minute, stretch goal, right? I, I think I can break the four-minute mile. Now, so he works with his coach. He's a medical, he's studying uh, medicine, uh, Oxford. I forget where we're at in London. And um, he breaks it down like, okay, wait a minute. Four, if I can break a four minute mile, I need to run each interval, right? Around the lap, around the track four times. Here, and so he measured it out. He figured out what he needed. He works with his coach. They, they knew exactly what times he needed to make. He knew he was going to break the four minute mile before he broke the four minute mile because he knew what his times were, his split times. So, so critical. Once he did that, once he set the world on fire, breaking the four minute mile, he changed the average. Guess what? Everybody else broke the four minute mile. I know we've talked about this, but it no, just, but it's a great point. I think this ties right in, ties right in, you know, so this whole base camp, so important guys, you know, if you're a manager or a leader, or maybe you're not, maybe you're an aspiring leader, you, you, you don't have a, a position of direct reports underneath you. Base camp is still critical. Make base camp really just something special. If you're a leader, make sure that um, you, it, it, we, we talk about, think of your team as a team of contributors. Allow their opinions to count. That's the first one. Number two, make sure that they, they realize that their job is important, that what they do is critical. And it is. They're contributors. So those two questions, base camp, really powerful. So once we, we're at base camp, you know, then we're trying, to, we're trying to figure out, do I belong here? You know, they're, they're trying to figure out, do I really belong in this organization? Think about this. If you've got employees, they want to know, do I, do, I really, do I really belong here? Am I part of this team? Um, oh, by the way, one sure tell sign that somebody hasn't bought into a company is when they're still describing the company as well, you guys, you ever seen that? You ever hear yeah. that where somebody says, well, you know, you guys have done this. You guys, you guys were able to no. when you change you guys to, we, then, then, you know, you, you're, then I know that uh, they're part of that team. So, so yeah. So do I belong here? Is that second camp camp two? That's camp two. I totally missed camp one. Well, yeah. Race camp and then camp one. Yeah. I went right to camp. See, this is what happens, guys. If you don't do it right, you're gonna, you're, <laughs> you're not gonna travel down up that mountain. So, camp one, what do I give? Camp one is what do I give? And so, those uh, four items there, the questions are: at work, I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day. All right, do those employees, wherever they're at, part of that team, do they have the opportunity to do what they do best at? Number four is in the last seven days, have they received recognition or praise for doing good work? And number five is, does the supervisor, someone at work, care about them as a person? And then finally, is there someone at work who encourages their development? So those are critical questions. Thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it, interestingly enough, and I stumbled along this, it's just a manager who was trying a bunch of stuff, but I had, I had a wonderful position at a bank uh, to run my first PMO. One of my great friends was my boss, and, and now he, he's my chief operating officer. We, we worked together for years, but he allowed me to really experiment. And so I was just, I was just reaching for stuff. And um, you know, my, uh, a friend of mine, Wayne Brady, was on a show, Whose Line Is It Anyway?, where they say everything's made up and the points don't matter. Yeah. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to have a game inspired by that for my team. And so I wanted my team to assign points to each other uh, for things that they saw throughout the week, basically looking for the good, yeah. right? And, and you could give whatever amount of points you want. And what we all did is we all put $10 into a pot and whoever had the most points at the end of the month got to decide where we were going to spend the money, but it had to be on the team. And they took it to whole new levels. They, they, they were donating it and, doing angel tree gifts and stuff, wonderful, wonderful moments. But 
what I, I noticed was the psyche change yeah. because they knew that they were going to be called on in a round table in, in an open environment in front of the team to give their points, which means they had to search all week for things that were point worthy. This team grew so close and so tight, and they were so different, Paul. I could I, each person on that team. There was not one person alike. You know, similar background, similar likes and dislike. You know, they were just so disjointed. But they gelled to the point that like people were and people that were on the floor of other teams were envious of that team. And I didn't really have anything to do with that. It's not like I was. I just came up with this suggestion, and they took it and ran. But the point of that is that they were being encouraged. They felt valued. They, uh, their opinions, you know, seemed to count. And uh, it was, it was just amazing to see. So I had stumbled along that. And, and then when I read this, I was like, oh, that's why that works. <laughs> you know, just sometimes yeah. you do something, it works. You have no idea. You think you've like uncovered this gold and turns out there's a whole science behind it. Um, but that's my personal experience around it. I thought it was just really cool to see. Yeah, I love that. I love that. All right. So now we finally get to camp two. Camp two is a, Hey, do I belong here? Like, wow. Okay. I'm, I'm past base camp. I'm past, you know, the camp one, what do I give? Like, okay, you know, here, here's my opportunity. But now we're, we're wondering like if we're counting, if we're climbing Everest and you get to camp two, this is the point where you're like, okay, I truly belong here or I don't. And so our employees feel the same way. Our team, our contributors are going to feel the same way. Do I belong here is the question that they're, they're trying to assess. And this is question seven, uh, eight, nine, and 10. So seven was a work. Hey, do my opinions seem to count? Right. If they're contributors, they want to know, do my opinions really count? Number eight, the mission or purpose of the company make me feel my job is important. Is that true? Um, they live, do they live that out? You know, um, it's a good question. My associates or fellow employees are committed to doing quality work. Do, do they see people around them? This is question number nine. And then question number 10 is I have, and I love this question. I didn't expect this, Rick. Number 10 is I have a best friend at work. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, if they, they can answer that question, if they can answer those questions in, a, in an affirmative positive then you got them at camp too. So thoughts on that? What's really interesting is I reflect on my career, right? This came out 21 years ago and um, we were still very much in coming, coming out of the eighties, nineties, right? This is right, right. As the dot bomb was, was, you know, coming. Um, but everybody kind of felt like a cog in the wheel. You're a number. I remember I left, yeah. I was at uh, Xerox, uh, had an amazing, amazing year. I was like, uh, I was like 285 or 300 some odd percent. Uh, it was 362 percent. That was the number. 362 percent of my plan. I mean, I was crushing it. Yeah. And layoffs were coming, and I was selected as a layoff because it was going to be too expensive to pay my bonus because I did too well. I yeah. overexceeded, and I was just like, "Man, I'm just a number." You know yeah. what I mean? Like it. And I ended up not getting laid off, but then I quit like four months later. And took the job at the bank um, because it wasn't about money for me. I wanted to feel important. But the point being is, is I remember having a discussion um, at Xerox about this book and they were like, oh, it's really touchy feely. It's really, you know, it's, it's, it's grand scheme, touchy feely. What's interesting is it's standing the test of time because one of the big shifts of the millennial generation is the, the social impact of a company, meaning yep. What I'm doing is it, I don't want to just do data entry. Like I want to do data entry for the Ugandan water project, with, which I know I'm, you know, supporting clean water in, in places, you know, they, they want to make a impact. And they, not only do they want to feel important, they want to know what we're doing is important and impactful to the world. Uh, and I just think that this was so foretelling because a lot of people kind of blew it off early on going out, oh, it's too touchy feely. Now this is the kind of the gold standard of companies. It, it is. Uh, and it should be. I, I, here's, this is what blew, blew me away. I, I thumbed through this book before and I it was like, I'll read it someday. Right. Um, you kind of brought this back in the forefront and then uh, I, I've just been eating this thing up. So I'm so excited that we are spending this podcast talking about this and uh, it's such an impactful, it's not touchy feely guys. This is breaking average 
concepts, no matter who you are, a leader, manager, uh, visionary, entrepreneur, these are the things that we need to do. And I love this mountain climb kind of experience with the base camp, camp one, camp two, camp three is how can we all grow? So that third camp before you reach the summit is how can we all grow camp, camp three? And it's centered on two questions. You know, um, the question number 11 is in the last six months, someone at work has talked to me about my progress, right? That's what employees, if they can say yes, then they're probably at camp, you know, at that camp right there, camp three. And then the, the last question is the last year I've had opportunities at work to learn and grow. That's the killer question. That's the last line kind of thing, right? Are you creating opportunities? you know, uh, for those around you to, to learn and grow. And um, we need to make sure that we're doing that, but that's not, that's not base camp one. That's not base camp. That's not camp one. That's camp three. So from there, Rick, then we can get to the summit and we all want to, we all want to get to the summit, don't we? We do. We do. I'm having a, a an experience at, at my work right now. I mean, I work for a, a leadership development company, right? Um, and it, it's funny because there's there's the set of, you know, the cobbler's kids have no shoes, right? A lot of times when you're developing this stuff, you don't have time for it, right? Like, yeah. That's the old joke. Um, but, you know, my boss uh, makes it a point to, to learn and grow. And I've never seen a company do this. I've always seen companies say that they invest in their employees. And then they do. They go and invest and they get them a library stuff or whatever to, to go read and do. But they never give them the time to go through it. They just don't, right? They, they're the the demands of the job is always pulling them in it where they don't have time to develop themselves. Um, at, at the company I'm at now, if you don't, um, th there's live events that, that we produce twice a week. And the expectation is the whole company's on it. That, that if we're emailing each other, slacking each other, or having meetings during that time, we, we kind of get in trouble, right? It's, it's an unwritten rule. We all, and, and as a matter of fact, then he follows up and asks us questions about the live in our sinks. So now you're kind of like, <laughs> you don't want to go, well, I blew that off because I was answering emails. Um, but I've never just seen anybody really make it a priority to have an opportunity to, to learn and grow while you're working. And, and it's yeah. been, a, it's been, a, I mean, I've, I've been doing this a long time now. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to get up there in age. I don't think I'll ever be as quite as old as you, Paul, but uh, <laughs> um, because every time, every time I take a step closer, you take a step further. I'm just saying. That's right. Uh, <laughs> that's how it's supposed to be. Well, let's just keep keep that path going. Yeah, let's keep that path going. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, I've I've been doing this a long time. I've never seen anybody make a commitment to that, and it does make a difference. Like I do get that energy twice a week. You know. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's so good. You know, one of the things, and guys, we got to close this. You know, there's so much more. We're going to invite you to go pick this book up, check it out, Kindle, go get the print version, listen to it. It's so practical. There's 34 talent themes in here, Rick, that he talks about that I want to highlight super fast that they break into four categories. Yep. The four categories are executing, influencing, relationship building, and strategic thinking. And those are really key guys. So if you're listening and you got a paper or pen, you should be a note taker. If you're not capture that, how are you executing? How are you influencing? How are you relation in the relationship building aspect? How are you in strategic thinking? That's you, but then start to evaluate those around you. What do you have? So these are really identifying strengths and there's 34 of these. In fact, there's a whole test you could do a strength finders test. That's part of the book. That's kind of the cool thing is there's an assessment, but I love those, uh, those strength domains, the executing, you know, they got themes in there, like in the executing theme, there's like achievers and arranger. I, I won't go through them all. There's so many good ones. We're going to leave some stuff for our readers to go get, but I love that piece that was in, uh, you know, it's throughout the book, but it's also an appendix C of the book. So thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I, I love the call out of it. Um, the other is, you know, the key that he focuses on, on selecting talent um, yeah. and hiring for talent. I thought was a, a really, really good pull um, because the, you have the myths of talents that he goes through, right? Myth number one is that talents are rare and special. And then myth number two, that some roles are so easy, they don't require talent, right? And again, in first break, all the rules, 
you know, they're like, oh, it's just a data entry person, but that could be the difference between 380,000 clicks versus, you know, uh, yeah. uh, 3 million clicks. Right. So yeah. talent is available everywhere. Um, we just yeah. had, um, we, we had a kid that we hired, um, a, a few months back that a lot of people passed on for different reasons. And, and I won't go into those, but the point is, is there was something about this kid that, that, that I liked and, and we, we pulled him on and he has turned into one of our highest performers because I knew he had untapped talent. You could just feel this. He was so earnest, like it, on time in his interview, so prepared for his interview, you know, all these different things. Um, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to take a flyer. I'm, I'm going to go. Uh, there's something about this, this kid I really like. And yeah. it was like one of the, like, I look like a hero at this point because he, he's such a high performer. Um, but the, the talent is found everywhere. We can't just, you know, check the boxes and yeah. I, I don't, uh, you know, in the day and age of zip recruiter and everything else, I, I, it's just rare to see how many people get filtered out over weird criteria when there's no way to discover their talent. I just think that's, that's interesting point. So true. Well, let's, uh, let's co go ahead and land the plane here. And so excited again. Um, this book is called first break all the rules, what the world's greatest managers do differently. So what's your tip and challenge there, Rick? Uh, let's see. Tip is to, to, to read the book <laughs> right now, but yeah. the, 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 the challenge I think is, is to really tune in over these next 16 we, Again, we're trying to bring not only the, the books, the personal side, but my challenge is to reread some of your favorites. Yes. If, if there is a book on your shelf that you recommend to people, or there's a book on your shelf that you just said, man, that, that's one of my favorite books. Um, read it again. Yes. Go through it again now and see what kind of impact it has. Um, uh, for me, I was talking about radical project management, and I, I, I remember having to apologize to my mentor um, because there were things that there were, were connections I made on stage. I, well, I'm an auditory thinker, so when I'm speaking on stage, I make these connections, and that becomes part of my shtick going forward. And there was two or three phrases I honestly felt in my heart I came up with. And when I reread his book, those, those concepts and ideas were there. And I was like, oh my goodness, I've been ripping you off for years. I had no idea. And he was so gracious. He was like, no, 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 you didn't rip me up. What are you saying? No, no, that's different. He was so funny. But my point is, is I had no idea how much impact that really had on my life and career and even the way I speak. Um, so I challenge you to, to read something that's sitting on your shelf. I love that. Love that challenge. Challenge accepted, Rick. I'm going to do that. So, you know, my tip and challenge, there's so many good nuggets in this book. And again, uh, as I shared at the very beginning, one of the things I like to do is the last line and really look at the last bit before there's any appendices. It tells me where it's going. It gives me the, the key nuggets. It's sort of like the Cliff Notes version of the book. <laughs> what's, what's it say in the end? So I, I really want to know. And there's some cool nuggets out of here, guys, that I want to share with you. First of all, it, they share throughout, but in, in, the, uh, in the concluding chapter, this, this book does not, doesn't offer to make your role easy, no matter what kind of leader you are, it's, it doesn't offer to make your role easier, but it does offer you really kind of a simple approach, a vantage point, as they say, to, uh, to, to really give you strength, right? To give you uh, the ability for uh, supporting and encouraging your team. It offers you a way to gain a clear perspective on what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how to do it better. So I love that idea. The tip Really, I'll, I'll go with the challenge and then I'll kind of come back on a tip. The challenge is right at the beginning of that last chapter. It's, they say this, just select for talent, define the right outcomes, focus on strengths, and then as each person grows, encourage him or her to find the right fit. And I love that. Four pieces right there, guys. Search for talent, define the right outcomes, focus on strengths, and then uh, encourage development, encourage growth. That is the challenge. It's a challenge for you individually as a leader, but it's also the challenge for those around you. Um, one of the, the tips that they say here is um, each company search for value and each individual search for identity. And boom, that kind of was a light bulb, Rick. Each company search for value and each individual search for entity, right? So we're trying to get the two on the same page. We're trying to maintain, you know, we want, the team to stay together, to be able to win together, to break average together, right? So we've got to search for value. We've got to, you know, really search for identity. That's what our team's looking for. And that will change 
change everything. They say it'll change the corporate landscape. You'll see new organizational models, new titles, new compensation schemes, new careers, new measurement systems. The question is, how are you breaking average? Because that's really what it's asking. How are you breaking average? And so I just encourage you guys, the tip really is search for value. That's the challenge. That's the tip, search for value. And um, you'll make a difference. You'll find things that you're going to do different in making a difference. So Rick, it's been fantastic. I've really enjoyed uh, just unpacking this book a little bit and invite our listeners and, and viewers to, to do the same. Yeah, it's been, it, I, I love talking through this. And once again, I'm inspired by our mission of, of breaking average. So hopefully everybody will follow along with us and uh, we've got another great book coming up in the next episode and uh, we hope to uh, see you then. That's right. We want to hear from you guys. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Breaking Average Podcast. If you loved what you heard, please take a moment to subscribe. All opinions and comments expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and do not reflect the opinions or views of any of the advertisers, producers, or platforms. This show was produced by R Squared Multimedia. A special thank you to Milestone Melodies for our theme music. As you continue your day, what is one action that you can apply from this podcast to your life? Tune in for our next episode as we continue to challenge everyone to break average.